Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Brett. Hi, Brett. I really am. I really, is this on? Okay, I really am. It has been 21 years and six months since my last drink, and I'm going to tell you a lot about my career and the contrasts in my personal life and in the work that I've done. Um, the talk that I'm going to do this afternoon is Tussen Oorlog en Liefde, Between Love and War, and it really is the contradiction of the way my life panned out. Um, if you don't know who I am, that's fantastic, because hopefully I can get a few more followers, and as we know, in this day and age, you're defined by how many followers you have. So it would be really nice if you could follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, my story is not your average introduction into photography. Uh, I was a policeman in the riot unit in South Africa during apartheid. Uh, very turbulent times, a lot of uh, political transformation from apartheid to democracy which is also another contradiction. And we saw and did and witnessed some incredible transformations in South Africa. Now, the images that I'm going to show you uh, might put you a little bit out of your comfort zone, but it is really to give you an introduction into who I am and why I think the way I think. Because basically what happened with me is we were on parade one day and the captain said, we need a photographer. Now, I had no inclination into photography. I didn't care about photography. Uh, I used to do a lot of things that I'm not really proud of these days, but it's made me who I am, so we all did things that we regret. Uh, creatively, uh, I couldn't even draw a stick figure. So you have to understand that photography just happened for me. Uh, the captain said, who wants to be a photographer? And Everybody looked around and said, no, no thanks. I'm not really interested in being a photographer because if you are uh, recording the uh, acts of criminals, you're photographing murders, political uh, uh, you know, activity and riots, then you're collecting evidence, you are the target. So you know, you're gonna have to have a full-time bodyguard with you and uh, it's not really that cool to have a job that you know, draws more attention than what you actually need. And secondly, Maybe your colleagues are doing things a little bit too enthusiastically, and uh, if you're photographing them doing things that they shouldn't be doing, they're not going to be your friend either. So nobody really wanted the job of police photographer. And then they said to us, you get your own car. <laughs> right, that's me. That is how I became a photographer. And in the early days, when people asked me what I did for, for a living, I would tell them, that I am a still life photographer. Now, I know that sounds a little bit uh, insensitive, but it kind of was bringing a little bit of humor to uh, what we used to do, because we saw some really, really dodgy things. The types of uh, incidents that we found, if you look up on the screen here, uh, the picture on the left, sorry, the picture, my left, your right, the picture on the right there, uh, that guy was uh, 18 years old. He came straight out, straight out of police college and uh, went on duty at 6.30 in the morning on his very first day. At 6.45, he attended an uh, armed robbery at, uh, at a bank um, and uh, he was shot dead after working for 15 minutes. Now, it's terrible and it's a, it's a tragedy for him and his family, obviously. But that was my first front page picture in the newspaper. And from that moment on, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. The picture on the left, if I look back now, maybe it was a little bit silly uh, to be opening up uh, the false bottom of a, of a lorry where they were smuggling uh, arms and ammunition across the border because there could have been hand grenades and limpet mines and stupid things underneath there. So maybe it wasn't the brightest thing to do. But I won an award for that shot uh, from, from, from a photojournalistic point of view. And again, that cemented the fact that I wanted to be a photographer. And really, I used photography to get out of being a policeman. I knew I never wanted to be a policeman for my whole life. I wanted now to use what I had learned in the police force 
to go out and shoot imagery that I could sell and not be a policeman anymore. So I didn't really care what I did as long as I wasn't a policeman anymore. So if I look back on my career, if they needed a chef, today I'd be a chef. If they needed a mechanic, today I'd be a mechanic. So it is not your uh, you know, stereotypical introduction into photography. It wasn't like, oh, when I was six years old, my dad gave me a box brownie and I was hooked. It wasn't like that. So I'm really in this position now by mistake in a way, which is a good thing and a bad thing because creatively I've had to teach myself how to be creative. Now most of you here are creative, but you have to teach yourself how to do business. Whereas I learned how to hustle long before I knew I was a photographer. So the reason I think that I'm successful is because my business side of things is a lot stronger than my creative side of things, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later. So we saw and witnessed the worst of what human beings can do to each other. I've seen old ladies with their heads cut off and their brains taken out, lips cut off. I've seen the worst of the worst. Uh, terrible things with children, uh, people burning each other alive. They put a, um, a tire over your body and put uh, petrol on the inside. They call it a necklace. And it's basically a kangaroo court. It's like a vigilante, uh, you know what I mean? There is, there is one over there, and you can see there are my colleagues uh, standing around, and this chap, this chap over here uh, was burned to death, maybe for stealing a TV or something like that. A lot of uh, things affected me, and I used to drink a lot. I would drink every single day. And when I say every single day, I'm talking about fall down drunk every single day, unless we were going uh, on night shift which meant that the night before I would drink until four o'clock in the morning so that I could sleep all day and then go to work. So I started doing drugs. I started drinking a lot. I didn't realize at the time it was because of what I was witnessing and the type of job that I had. This incident over here, I think there were about 17 or 18 people killed in taxi violence. Now, when we talk about taxi violence, this is public transport. And you basically have two different uh, taxi companies that uh, are competing for the same route. And uh, if the one got more passengers than the other, then there would be a war, and you'd end up with your whole taxi passengers, yeah, taxi war, and you'd have 17 people dead on the floor. And we'd be there. With the, with the paramedics and everything to pick up the pieces. You guys are very quiet. You're freaking me out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is the Urloch side of things that I've shown you over here. And I'm going to fast forward my life to 20 years later where I'm still an addict, but I have channeled my addiction or my addictive personality into other things. I'm addicted to running. So this morning I ran 15 Ks before I came here. Uh, every day I need to run, otherwise I get freaked out. Uh, and that has become my drug. So in terms of my addictive personality, I've channeled that into something which is good. It's not so good for my marriage when I wake up at four o'clock in the morning to go for a 40K or a 50K run because my personality is very much black and white. It's all or nothing. So if I'm gonna run, I'm not gonna do marathons, I'm gonna do ultra marathons. And there's a, there's a race that, uh, that I've done um, in the past which is called the Comrades uh, Marathon, which is uh, 90 kilometers. And I've done that 24 times. So. I might not drink alcohol, but I'm still a, little bit, uh, still a little bit messed up. So fast forward to my wedding career. I've got so many other things that I could tell you about here, but um, apparently I'm going to get pulled off the stage in about eight minutes time. So fast forward my career to about 20, 20 years after that, and I'm going to show you now the contradiction into what I was doing before and what I'm shooting now. So my wedding imagery, <laughs> my wedding imagery is very, very different, as you can see, to 
the type of work that I did before. Now, like I said, my personality is quite extreme. If I'm going to do something, I do it properly. If I'm going to drink, I'm going to drink properly, and I'm going to fall down drunk. If I'm not going to drink, I don't drink one drop for 21 years, 6 months, 12 days. And <laughs> okay. And if I'm going to be a wedding photographer, I'm going to be the best wedding photographer in the world. I am going to do everything I can possibly do to do the best work that I could possibly do. So the type of work that I do isn't your average wedding photography type of, type of uh, shoot. Now, the reason why it's not your average type of shoot is for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is the, the, the photographic industry, obviously, as you know, has become very, very saturated. There are a lot of photographers all fishing in the same pond, and the fish are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But there's a lake over the mountain with big fish in it, but people aren't prepared to walk for two days to go to that lake to go fishing in a different market. Everybody's very comfortable trying to fish for smaller and smaller fish. And in this market here, there are less fishermen. I target higher end weddings. I target weddings that where, where people have so much money that the price doesn't really matter. It's a very difficult market to get into. You've got to walk for two days to get to the different lake, but there are no other fishermen there. So understanding that the type of imagery that I'm producing is different to the type of Im imagery people are producing for the middle market is key to my success. And the reason I'm talking about that now is because most photographers start out shooting for friends and family or for colleagues, right? When you very first start out photography, you've got a cool camera and all your friends and family say, oh, wow, you take such amazing pictures. Can you take pictures of my family? Oh, my daughter's getting married. Can you take pictures of that? Or my colleague's getting a colleague at work. Now, that is the very first wedding that I ever shot. He was a colleague of mine. He was a policeman and a colleague of mine. Now, the problem with shooting for friends and family is generally your friends and family are very similar people to you, right? They wear the same clothes. They eat in the same restaurants. They dress the same. They go to the same movies. They smell the same, all that kind of stuff. So your friends are very similar to you, right? Right? Which means they don't have any money either. <laughs> So targeting your friends and family is not a good idea. Because if you target your friends and family, you're going to be in a market where you're hustling as well. And one of the key things to work out whether you're targeting the wrong market is to understand that if you can afford yourself, and think about it now because I'm coming with the punchline, can you afford yourself now, right now? Could you afford a photo shoot with you? If you can, you're too cheap. And the reason you're pricing yourself like that is because you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking, what would I pay? Not thinking about what would a specific target market pay. Now, photography is like the restaurant industry. You've got, everyone's a chef. You just watch all Rudolph on 24 Kitchen and everyone's a chef, right? You can go now and go and get uh, Mbrocha from the Albert Hain and you can get some, uh, some sausages and now you're selling hot dogs. You're a chef. Right? Just like, just like with the photography industry. You can go watch a couple YouTube uh, things and you, you're, you're a photographer. Or you can open a fine dining restaurant. Your choice. To open a fine dining restaurant takes a lot more effort, right? You're going to need to have a restaurant and tables and chairs and a knife and fork and a good chef and staff and a good atmosphere. And it's going to take you two years before you open up that, that fine dining restaurant. To go and sell brooches on the side of the road, easy. But everyone's doing it. A lot of competition. You can't make money selling hot dogs in this industry at the moment. So, there's 150 people right here right now. How many of you, and be honest, and I've only got two minutes left, how many of you have made a business plan for your photography business? How many of you sat down and decided, I'm going to run my own business and I have a business plan? Hands up very quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Six out of 150. Okay, I'm not talking to you six, right? <laughs> Seriously, people, how do you run a business without even a business plan? Do you think that Unilever decide to launch a new product without researching the market? How many of you have, you have researched your market? You're feeling a bit uncomfortable. That's cool. You're meant to feel uncomfortable. Understanding that your brand is so, so important to you because your brand is your differential. Your product and your service can be, can be replicate, replicated, but your brand is your differential. And right now, right now, you are all exuding a brand. So think about the fact that you're here amongst your competition and your opposition, and they are looking at you, and if you're the one who stands out because you're different or because you have a different type of brand, you're going to create a buzz about yourself. So ask yourself this question. When you got up this morning and you knew that 149 other photographers were going to come and see you, because you're going to meet them there when we're having brooches uh, in the Skadu over there. <laughs> When you, when you woke up this morning and you got dressed and you looked at yourself in the mirror, did you ask yourself, this is the best I can do? Feeling uncomfortable? Good. Because every single day you need to ask yourself, is this the best I can do? And if you're saying no, then change it. Because you are your own brand and you need to understand that when you look at your target market profile, all these type of things over here. If you think about your current target market, all those things relate to yourself. If you think about your ideal client, then that's very different. Now, my ideal client, I'm going to help you forget about all this research because if you went to a research company, it would cost you a lot of money to, to get uh, the information that you needed to target a specific client. So how did I do that? Because I'm a hustler, because I, I uh, knew that, that uh, you know, I was a policeman. We're talking to an alcoholic policeman here. So how did I do all my research? Basically, I read Vogue, Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, because that's the type of magazine my clients read. I read OK Magazine and Heat and all those magazines that my clients don't ever see. So people with more money than me live a completely different lifestyle to me, and they see the world visually very, very differently. So, I looked in the Vogue, Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, and I saw this woman, and I, that's, my, that's my client. Now, how do I target that client? Now, instead of me doing all my research and my marketing and that to target that type of client, I just take Estee Lauder's uh, research and use what they've done because I look at all the color palettes, the font and all that type of stuff to put into my branding. So my branding now is this. And I've kind of piggybacked on somebody else's research so I don't have to do that. And then my logo is that which hopefully, and there's a lot of it, I've already been told I'm minus one minute now. I can feel a hook in my back starting to pull me off. <laughs> but basically, and this is a very, very small part of, what, of, my, of, of the way I use my bait to catch a big fish rather than small little fish. Basically, I understand that my brand is so much more important than my photography. Because the problem with photography these days, and a lot of you do this, is you go out and you shoot some stuff, you put it on your page, and you hope that you'll get clients. Instead of going out, researching the market, finding what's missing in the market, and then shooting stuff to fill that gap. That's what I've done. All my work is shot to fill the gap for clients who like high fashion wedding photography. And I'm going to finish off by talking about one specific saying. No, two. The first one, the first one. <laughs> oh, now I've lost my train of thought. Okay, the first one I'm, I'm going to say is, most people won't get it, but that's the point. All right, and if you didn't get it, that's cool too. All right, most people won't get it, that's the point. And the second thing I want to finish off with, if you want to achieve something that you've never achieved before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. You cannot 
sit around doing the same thing week after week after week, hoping one day to catch a big fish. Please follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Mr. Brad Florence. Thank you. Thank you.